a good afternoon or you know maybe good morning depending on where you're joining us uh, from in the world today my name is samantha wentz i am the event specialist here at beam and on behalf of beam benefits i'd like to welcome and thank everyone for joining us today as we take a, a look at the workplace revolution how to meet the needs of a changing workforce so as we get started, I want to review just a few housekeeping items. Please note that all of you are muted, but should you have any questions at any point, please feel free to submit them via the Q&A feature located in, your, located in your toolbar found at the bottom of your screen. And after the webinar, we will send out the slides and a recording. So quick overview of what we're going to be covering today um, or what will be covered today by our two wonderful speakers. Uh, Alex Frohmeyer, who is the co-founder and CEO of Beam Benefits, and Haley Major, the Senior Director of Sales here at Beam. Um, so just take a quick glance at that. This is what we're going to be hitting today. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and toss it over to, to Haley and Fro to introduce themselves and take it away. Uh, thanks, Samantha. Much appreciated. Haley, you ready to do this thing? I'm ready. Uh, we're going to start with quick intros of ourselves, and then we've got a lot of exciting stuff to talk about, so really appreciate everyone joining us this morning or this afternoon. Uh, Haley, how about a quick intro, and then I'll do mine. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Haley Major. I am the Senior Sales Director here at Beam. Um, I've been with Beam for coming on five years and um, started out selling our product, and I now run the west half of the country. And I am Alex Frohmeyer, one of our three co-founders here at Beam, our CEO. And over the past 10 years, we've been incredibly excited to um, start, continue, and um, will continue uh, developing a business that we're incredibly proud of, helping modernize employee benefits, digitize employee benefits, and make the entire benefits industry um, fit our vision of being simple, smart, and wellness focused. So with that, we're going to introduce the company, um, do a little bit of an overview of Beam, and then we're going to get into today's subject matter about the changing workforce. First up is we would like to learn more. Um, so we're going to actually open up um, a quick uh, poll to uh, allow us to begin to learn a little bit more about our audience today. So there's three options just to allow us to gauge a little bit of your all's familiarity with Beam. So there's three options, which is you're familiar with us and have quoted with us in the past, familiar but haven't quoted, or you might be totally new to learning about Beam. So if you can just take a minute to uh, answer the poll, that'll help us uh, tee up today's discussion with that in mind. I'm gonna say I'm familiar with Beam. I'll second that. <laughs> All right, Samantha, do we have everybody? Oh, here we go, here's the return. So um, looks like 60% of the group's familiar and have quoted with us in the past, much appreciated. Uh, an incremental 17% is familiar with Beam but haven't quote us, quoted with us. And we've got about a quarter of our audience today that's completely new to Beam, so welcome. We'll teach you more. That's really exciting actually. Okay, so especially for our new folks, um, here's a little bit on Beam. So we're a 10 year old company. We're based in Columbus, Ohio. We actually have a new office, which I'm in right now, which we're really excited about right here on some park space in the middle of downtown Columbus, Ohio, wonderful town as well. Um, we are all about at Beam simpler, smarter employee benefits. Um, so our approach um, is working backwards from being the smartest, the simplest, and most wellness focused company in our segment. And you can see on the right panel, the products that we offer at Beam. Up until about 90 days ago, we were known in the market as Beam Dental. And the reason why is our core product, original product, and still today our largest and lead product at Beam is high quality, fully insured, uh, group focused, uh, digital dental insurance for SMBs all over the country. We're operating in 43 states around the US these days. And we have this really unique approach and differentiated approach to 
uh, dental insurance, which we've now used the lessons we learned in that demo product and parlayed it into vision, life, disability, and now self-health. Um, more products on the way in the future as well. This has been an incredibly exciting journey we've been on to expand into a full and robust ancillary carrier. A bit of a um, look at the subject matter today is all catalyzed by this huge macro rotation that's happening in the market today. And everyone here is familiar with it, and you've probably been on a bunch of other webinars talking about at least some of these subjects. But it's important to contextualize, for example, why Beam being a digital first carrier is so important in the market, especially right now and why some of the changes to the workforce and how they're orienting around the subject matter of employee benefits is changing so quickly. Some of it is the great resignation. This is still happening, even though the market's changed a lot, actually in 2022, um, more Americans than at any other previous two year time period in history have quit their jobs, resigned from their jobs and moved to a new opportunity. And this is continuing to happen every single month this is suggestive in our view of a change in the actual makeup of the economy itself um, and is continuing to transform at an ever more rapid pace. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Also true that employee benefits are playing a larger role in decision making for the attraction and retention of talent with today's employers, especially small employers today, which you can see reflected in also how people teams and HR teams have been challenged with how do I meet the needs of our workforce? How do we attract the talent we need to win as a business? And how do we do it all with a likely completely remote or partially remote workforce? We have that challenge at Beam today. I'm in the office today. Haley's in Columbus, but at her house. And then Samantha, who's running the webinar today, is in a completely different location. And because of that, we have these challenges on how we coordinate meetings like today, as well as topic areas like benefits and other people processes. All right, so here's our tee up, our thesis for today's chat. The future of work is already here today. The workplace has forever changed and it's reshaping in particular company culture, industry trends and employee expectations. So we're gonna dive into all three of these topics and more. One thing I've been talking about increasingly, whether it's at, um, on a podcast, um, some media appearances, even some conferences I've been to throughout the year, is really tying together this idea that part of your company's culture is reflected in your benefits package. A good demonstration of this is with a company like Google, who 20 years ago became famous for all their perks and how they set up their office with you know, bicycles and a volleyball court out front and sleeping pods and free food in the kitchen. A lot of these have become standards in Silicon Valley and now the tech industry and even beyond the tech industry. Um, but at the time when Google first introduced many of those uh, benefits or extra employee perks, they were the only company in the world doing them and it allowed them to communicate their unique company culture through the benefits that they were offering to their team. And it allowed them to stand out and attract or retain talent. And those types of opportunities have never been more present for a wider swath of the workforce than they are today. Yeah, and you know, for all, I think that um, one of the pretty interesting things is that as we're talking about employee benefits being part of culture and that, um, you know, they're, that these employee benefits that add into culture are getting really complex and there's a lot of stuff that's really high tech um some of the stuff is like really easy right like feeling valued is a huge part of company culture and you know that can range from being compensated well to having um you know really great benefits to also just basic recognition um and i think that recognition is just a really huge and important thing um, you know, there was a recent Gallup poll that said that employees who don't feel adequately recognized are two times more likely to quit their jobs. So, um, you know, there's things that you can do to implement really like tech savvy benefits that are all around this recognition thing, um, but also really easy stuff like picking up the phone and calling somebody to say, hey, great job, sending a text, sending a Slack, um, having, you know, these public 
um, Slack channels or um, places that you can go just to tell someone, great job. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those tried and true things that while a lot of it is evolving, there's some stuff that's just really simple. That's right. I think you nailed it. And your journey at Beam over the past five years is reflective of this. You started as an individual contributor on our sales team. Now you're leading sales teams. How have you thought about that employee recognition component as you've added that to your quiver and part of your accountability or responsibilities as a leader at Beam? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm probably going to say this a ton of times throughout this, but I, I hate making this like a Beam commercial. Um, but I think Beam's done a really great job at really making sure that that sort of recognition piece is kind of integral to who we are. And um, it's just a super collaborative culture. And so I think that when you build that, um, that, you know, recognition is just, it's just kind of core to who we are. So it was always important to me as an individual contributor to receive recognition, but also um, because it just makes you feel good, recognize other people. And so as I've moved up through the organization, just making sure that that continues to be um, something that, you know, we really value and double down on, um, you know, whenever we've got big wins coming through, it's awesome that we see you reaching out to reps and, um, you know, Tim, our SVP of sales will pick up the phone and call people for, you know, a great job well done. And it just means a lot. It goes a really long way. Love it. Those topic areas are part of the company's culture. And then how that synchronizes with simple decisions you make on your benefits packages, what products are offered, the uh, vendors that you choose to work with are also important components that employees are looking at when they're choosing which employer to work for or looking at how the culture is developing at a company. They're looking for signals that the workforce or that their uh, employer aligns with their particular values, whatever those are. So here's a little bit more on Beam's culture, and then we for sure aren't going to make this uh, a Beam commercial from here out, but this gives you a little bit of an illustration about how Beam approaches our culture inside the business. Every company is different, so every approach is different, but this is a little bit of a, a peek behind the curtain at how we think about it at Beam. We build our core values around an acronym of GRIT, and we added a second T to the GRIT as well a few years ago because we wanted to reflect what was at the time a really fast growing company, still true today, and an expanding need for our values to capture the true essence of what being a great Beamer is. So we built the GRIT acronym to represent growth, resilience, initiative, tenacity, and being team first. These are all incredibly important values that we interweave into everything we do at Beam. Performance management discussions, one-on-ones, the themes behind many of our all-hands meetings, uh, how we operate in the market, and many other topics that show up to, in day-to-day -day life inside the company leverage these values in a way that keep them from being just philosophical concepts, but instead tactical realities of what it means to work in the business. Haley, any thoughts here to add? Yeah, um, so I've worked for a lot of very, very large companies, and I couldn't tell you um, really any of the core values, if not all of the core values um, off the top of my head. And so I, I think that sometimes core values, they end up as like a nicety that just live on a company's website and that's all they do. And you might read about it in an interview prep and then that's the last time that you hear about it. Um, so I think just, you know, really interweaving your core values and then living and breathing them every day is so important. So, um, you know, you mentioned that we're talking about it on all hands, but it really even starts throughout our interview process. Um, what I love is that because it is core of who we are, is that you can have someone whose skill sets align perfectly on paper and they're totally able to do the job that they're interviewing for, but if they don't have grit and, it, and that's what we really are screening for in one of our final rounds of an interview, it's always a no. And I love that, that that's how you maintain culture by making sure that it's not only being talked about every day, but that you're screening for it on the front end and you're not having to like build it and teach somebody how to 
live the culture that you want, but you're hiring people who really fit into the culture that um, you've built. So I think that that's just a wonderful thing that Beam does. And we always say this as well, Haley, which is we can teach you about the benefits industry, but we can't teach you how to have grit. And so okay. we will always select for people that have those core values at their uh, kind of already naturally existing in themselves. And then we try to do a lot to draw it out. For example, uh, how much did you know about insurance and the employee benefits world before you started at Beam five years ago? Um, that I had an insurance card in my wallet and that I could show it to a dentist whenever I got to the dentist. And that's about it, right? About it. I don't think I knew what a coinsurance was, marginally familiar with the term deductible. So come a long way, bro. Now you're teaching other people at the company how to position dental and ancillary benefits um, to help them as employers succeed uh, in the market. It's an amazing transformation, which is indicative of your grit in the business and how that's actually come alive in your career growth, but also how you've been able to be a valued member of the Beam team throughout the entire entirety of your tenure here. It's amazing. Well, thank you. One of the shifts in the market that we're really keen on um, today is this shift from office centricity. Ironically, I'm saying this from our office right now. Uh, but today's workforce is increasingly remote or increasingly hybrid. We see a lot of hybrid cultures developing uh, post-pandemic here. Uh, Beam no, is no exception. Um, and so it really means that increasingly we're going to see benefits products being tied to the person. So person centricity to our benefits instead of office centricity. An easy example here is in the days pre-pandemic where everything was built around the office, you might have built a commuter benefits or the, the free parking pass or uh, snacks in the kitchen. And those, while super relevant perks and benefits that tied out to a cultural ideal in the business may be less relevant now because the company has fewer employees that are going to the office or they're going to the office less often, which means benefits that stay with the person, especially ones that are health related, um, have become really popular in contrast over the past couple of years. Yeah, um, I, uh, I heard somebody say something like snacks are cool, but winning is better. Um, and don't get me wrong, I love the in-office perks. I love the snacks. Our office, we just moved into a very, very cool new office. Um, you know, bean bags, all of that stuff. It makes coming into the office a great experience. Um, but, you know, I think that investing in people so that they have the tools to be the best they can be, you know, masters of their crafts, better at their job, uh, marketable for the next promotion or for the next big move is really meaningful and just super, super impactful. Love it. Um, so let's pose a question to the group um, uh, for those here. You can see it on the screen. Outside of medical, major medical health insurance, that is, what benefits do you think today's employees want most? Just curious to get a quick sense of uh, what your all's top of mind thoughts are these days. And Haley, we just want folks to ping in the chat, right, so we can see real time. Yep, um, Sarah just posted out there that um, you can chat us and make sure that you have it um, to the recipients, our hosts and panelists. Ah, uh, that, that's right, that'll come to us. This is my first time doing one of these, so we'll see no. how, uh, how many of these come through. All good, as we're filling those in, on the next slide we have some uh, thoughts on how we've structured and again been kind of speaking externally as well already um, as a business around how the benefits of today or maybe the benefits of tomorrow, the near tomorrow, the near future are increasingly being structured. And for us, it's topic areas like um, a holistic approach to healthcare, for example. And what we mean by holistic is that the expansion of benefits is starting to go beyond just placing a, um, a health insurance product with especially a small business that has increasingly struggled to afford uh, a medical benefit. 
And they're doing so in a way that has, of course, really ramped up the deductible. Um, so in order to save money, the high deductible health plan has left a lot of gaps in coverage. So now we're starting to see employers fill in those gaps in coverage with, for example, subhealth, accident, critical illness, hospital coverage, more and more dental and vision is being packaged in, which was already a trend before the pandemic. All of this is meant to address the entirety of the person's health instead of just what a core major medical policy typically covers. All right, we've got some. Haley, do we have any results inside our uh, we, we have top benefits? Some. Yeah, we've got a couple. We've got um, EAPs, dental, um, lots of dental in here, uh, more calm. Um, hospital, accident, these are the big ones that are popping through. Mental health, that's a huge, Mental huge health. one. Um, really, as I was doing a little bit of digging into, you know, what are employees asking for in some of those um, big national polls, ancillary benefits are huge, retirement plans, family care, so um, elder care, child care, um, PTO and leave, professional development opportunities, DE&I programs to promote inclusivity, um, flexible work arrangements, modified work weeks, and then a huge one that's just popping up all over the place is mental health programs. Yeah, we've seen, it's probably, mental health is probably the fastest growing single product I've seen in my career in the benefit space going from relatively off the radar of the average client and probably average broker to now being a relatively front and center topic, almost that it's expected. And I don't think I've ever seen a transformation happen that fast from off the radar to a quasi expectation of many of uh, today's employers and certainly employees. It's amazing actually. Yeah, absolutely. On the next slide, we kind of typify, I would say, categories of how we think about some of these mega trends. I spoke to one earlier, which is this um, holistic approach to healthcare, more robust, you know, addressing the entirety of, of the person's healthcare instead of just what a major medical policy covers. I think it's also worth pointing out that ancillary benefits of different flavors, many of you just dropped uh, those products or um, experiences. Um, in the chat just now, we're also seeing a rise in those coverages. Maybe they're less expensive than healthcare, and so the, uh, an employer can build a, um, as long as they can control their medical cost um, to a degree, they can use any savings they're able to create or the design of that medical plan to offer a larger package of ancillary benefits. And then many employers are also just upping their allocation and their budgets to make sure they can offer uh, what today's workforce is looking for just to purely be able to continue competing in the workforce for the top talent. Uh, then the third category we're seeing a ton of in the changing workforce is digital tools going from a nice to have to a need to have. Um, Haley can speak to this, but we've got to be seeing a pretty big transformation here over the past two years on open enrollment, going from a thing that you would see a lot of in-person attendance for to now something that needs to be coordinated online. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think we're starting to see a little bit more of um, the sort of the flow back to in-person, but really uh, all throughout the pandemic, just, you know, having having access to digital tools so that you can you know, have FaceTime without having that face-to-face -face time is just so important, for sure. It's also increasing the burden on, you know, which we see in our uh, business as a carrier, but also with, I'm sure, all of our broker partners, there's a heavier burden on education, decision support, and those digital tools that a company like Beam is building and promoting, as well as third parties that are helping uh, fill in these gaps. Uh, are becoming really, really critical to connecting employees to knowing what a company offers, understanding if it applies to them and their interests, and then being able to support their journey with an experience which might be a first time thing. I remember getting health insurance for the first time and I'm like, what do I do now, right? Because I, similar to you, is like, I'm pretty sure I know what a deductible is, but I'm actually not completely sure I know what a deductible is. And having those sorts of uh, decision support tools in the early education during those journeys can be incredibly important. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that um, the, the digital tools, even from the member side or the employee side, are just an expectation almost without even realizing it's an expectation. Um, you know, I, I hear people say all the time, like, when was the last time you called your bank? You don't because you have everything you need in your hand and your phone. So, you know, being able to log into your dental insurance and see, you know, what did your claim look like? What do you owe? Who, which providers are in network? All of that. It's just one of those things that like, if you don't have it, then it, it's, you're, it's just an expectation that we do. And so if you don't, everyone kind of scratches their head. You got it. Yeah. My bank doesn't even have a physical branch in, um, the city I live in. Uh, so the banking industry has changed a lot. We would suspect oh, yeah. that benefits and insurance aren't far behind. Absolutely. All right, so let's dive into some of these mega trends. So what do employees want in today's evolving workplace? Um, so first up uh, in this view is um, in, an evolution to a new set of priorities, or maybe these were priorities before with some uh, employers, but um, now many more employers or majority or super majority uh, would now agree that increased flexibility is absolutely critical. Um, creative benefits, which we should dive in on. I'd love to get your thoughts on that one, uh, Haley. And then the third category is communication. That probably speaks back to what we were just talking about, which is um, how do you actually let your workforce know that the benefits that you offer are being offered, that you're eligible for them, and that you can, you know, um, leverage them and add them to your experience with that employer. Haley, what are your thoughts on creative benefits? How do you see that evolving in the in the market? Yeah, um, you know, I think that like the there's the basics, right? So you know, you expect that there's going to be um, medical coverage, ancillary benefits. Um, uh, you know, all of those other pieces. Um, but I think that some of the cool things that are really emerging are, um, you know, really things that let people focus and be present at work. So employees are always at their best whenever they're focused and present, but it's almost impossible to be laser focused on work and to be focused professionally whenever you have something really big happening personally. So having those benefits that allow you to let some of the the personal things simmer like any of the mental health programs like we talked about um as well as like student loan repayment assistance programs those are huge um you know whenever you're it, it's hard to be excited about a competitive salary when so much so much of that is going towards repaying the degree that you needed to get the job so those i think are really really cool um, also like pet insurance, right? So I can think of, I don't know, 20 people on my team who got new pets during the pandemic. I unfortunately was not one of them. My husband has this arbitrary cap on number of dogs at two that I just think is a little bit silly. Um, but I do have a 13 year old puggle who, despite all of the hours of sleeping every day, did manage to tear his ACL. So that was like 2,500 bucks out of the pocket that it's, you know, it's stressful to think about that. And, you know, whenever you have these creative benefits like pet insurance, it allows you to have that be less of a burden so that you can focus on things throughout the day, like your job. So I think that some of those are interesting and different and go a really long way. Another huge category you just spoke to, we're seeing a ton of interest in similar to mental health is financial wellness, whether it's like the student loan end of the spectrum or helping uh, manage retirement. Uh, people are always curious about, you know, do it, you know, does my employer offer a 401k? Okay, well, what else is there? How do I make sure I'm saving enough money? And how do I know if I am? And how do I invest? And how do I get started in participating in new and emerging markets as well? Um, those are really complex topics that, you know, we're fortunate to have a lot of those tools that are now available in the market. It's about getting them to um, the employers so they can position them as part of that robust benefits offering. And that's a topic area we're really excited about the future being. Okay, in our uh, mega trends wrap up, three 
areas that we talked about today, and then we'll rotate to some uh, questions uh, with everyone here as we uh, finish up today's webinar, um, are these three categories. So the first thing that we think is most important to communicate, and we'll be continuing to spend a lot of time on that you'll expect to see more and more from Beam, is this key connection between company culture ultimately being an employee benefit. And so when you think about a truly robust benefits offering, Yes, it's, it's true benefits and tactical products, like an insurance product that protects you against uh, um, an adverse uh, event or helping Haley fix her dog's uh, torn ACL. Uh, but it's also the company culture and how it reflects its values, recognition, support, enablement of folks to do their best work. It's even a decision a company makes on how we work or where, I guess, physically we work. Are we completely remote? hybrid or everybody in the office. And that simple decision, it's not actually a simple decision, but it's just one of the many ways you can communicate what you value as an employer to your workforce. And those decisions all roll up uh, alongside the tactical benefits that a company like Beam offers and that brokers like you all are positioning with your clients. They're all part of that same discussion. And today's HR teams, people teams, they need all the help they can get, especially small employers are really struggling to keep up um, with how all of the micro decisions made here and there roll up to um, a cogent approach and a consistent approach to culture, especially with uh, the war on talent being more acute than ever. Second area is new standards are being set. So um, the bar has been raised, I think, very clearly over the past couple of years. I think the how the talent market has responded post-pandemic and all of the changes to where people want to work, all those resignations, those people are popping back up at different employers. So there's been a big shuffling of the cards, uh, especially of top talent. Um, and that, and with that has come what used to be a, an extra or a delighter is now increasingly becoming table stakes. Dental insurance went through that transition um, a decade ago. It went from being something that was kind of nice if your employer offered it. You'd expect it from the Fortune 500, but not from a SMB. Now, pretty much every small business is offering some sort of solution for dental or dental and vision in life. Um, we think that is going to continue to become the norm, not the exception for other benefits categories as well. Third area, and then we can take some questions, is that employee expectations have also evolved. Again, post-pandemic, as people have come back to work, they've started to look more critically at where they live and what type of work environment they want and what type of employer and values they want to associate with. Uh, Companies benefit strategies, which you're really only getting a bite at that apple once a year or so, the benefit strategies are now catching up to these evolving realities of how um, today's employees are looking at where they want to work and how they want to invest their time and their career. And so we think that that evolution is not over. It's still a story that um, is going to be unfolding over the coming years. Haley, any thoughts as we uh, kind of finish up the formal part of today's webinar? Well, I have a lot of thoughts, but I think we've got a lot of questions that are starting to pop in through the chat. Well, do you want to get rolling on those? This is the fun part, so let's do it. All right, here we go. All right, um, so the first one, um, kind of going back to, we talked a little bit about the great resignation in the beginning. Um, why are people leaving jobs and companies in mass? And then how can companies entice people not to quit? I think there's a lot of drivers. There's no single answer to why people are resigning. We do a lot of this, um, you know, soul searching and beam too. We are a company that's growing incredibly fast. We invest a lot in culture. We offer incredible, um, you know, career and professional growth experiences. Uh, but we've also seen an increase in resignations in, in our business over the past couple of years. You know, I think one of the drivers for sure that I spend the most time thinking about personally is, um, how important is it to an employer to try to be all things to all people? And if the selection process, we're based here in Ohio, for example, if the selection process previously was people wanted to work for a really exciting company in Ohio, as you might have done in a more office centric environment before the pandemic, Beam would be one of the companies on your radar, or maybe even a company that you proactively reach out to looking for roles on our career page. And in the post-pandemic world, 
you might no longer have the same criteria. You might just want to work for an exciting company, period. That part about it being in Ohio isn't as important to you as it was two years ago. And that simple change now opens up not just a few more opportunities, it opens up asymmetrically more opportunities, exponentially more opportunities to you. And so employers uh, can be shocked by that transformation because it happened essentially overnight. And now we're not competing to be the most exciting company on your block. We're competing to be the most exciting company in the world, or certainly in the United States. And I think that alone has led to people wanting to look for different opportunities. But it's also an opportunity for employers too, because people from other places are also looking at you or could be looking at you and want to come to you. That's why we think benefits and a very forward facing, well articulated culture are such powerful weapons in that attraction equation, because you can now compete to win talent as well on a national or even global basis. Yeah, and you know, for all, I'll add to that, um, I know that that you had said that you know the Great Resignation isn't going anywhere; it doesn't seem to be slowing down. Um, you know, I think another thing adding to that, especially with uh, you know young people and younger people entering the workforce, is that they're realizing that they don't have to work for a large employer to make ends meet, right? So, um, you know, rising healthcare costs and the need for access to traditional benefits is super crucial, but then you have companies entering the marketplace like Astride that help gig workers and independent contractors get access to affordable healthcare coverage. So that's why it's so important that, um, you know, employers are looking at ways to add in really creative benefits into their benefits book. So. You got it. And when we think about advising, which we do a lot of, we spend a lot of time with other founders and small business owners. And, you know, one thing we spend a lot of time on with them is how to articulate your company culture, you know, tactical, like what benefits do you offer? That's a piece of it, but it starts with what's your mission? What are your values? What do you care about? What are your expectations? Who is going to be successful? What type of person is going to be successful at your business? And then how are you different? It's just the way we differentiate our products at Beam from other competitors in the market. If you're an employer uh, competing for talent, you have to tell the talent why you're different. Why would people work at your shop versus the shop up the street? And those are maybe obvious things to point out, but for small business owners, they have so many things to worry about. Really sitting down and thinking through what makes them unique and allow them to attract the talent they need to win is a phenomenal exercise. And it's a very easy way for uh, their broker partners to show value uh, beyond just the you know open enrollment period and helping them shop for benefits. Absolutely. All right, All right what else? The next one. All right. Um, let's see. What about? So now we're talking. We're sort of shifting gears into the the physical workspace. So what about companies that may be reluctant? to adopt a remote or digital first way of working? And then how do you propose that they balance employees varying levels of comfort or acceptance with these new ways of working? We are, it's a phenomenal question. It's one of those um, uh, easy sounding questions that's actually got huge implications and consequences to it. Um, we also spend a lot of time with small business owners wrestling with this um, same sort of, of uh, question. My advice is always um, for an employer to first really understand what they need, not what they want, what they need. I wish, for example, as a company leader, we had even more participation in our physical space um, uh, here at Beam. We've got a shiny new office. It's amazing. You've uh, been to it a bunch daily and it's uh, fantastic. We've got all these amenities. We've got um, a fantastic setup and it's so much fun to be like physically around the energy and the, and the density of people every single day. But it's something I want to have. It's not something we need to have. We've been a very effective as a business and we've grown a ton um, being a remote first company. And so I know we can continue to grow and succeed in the market without it. So for a business owner, for example, to decide, is this a nice to have or a need to have um, is step one. And then once you make that decision, let's say you really want everyone to return to the office. 
It's about being consistent and clear upfront. And you need to be prepared to lose because in today's environment, there's going to be some segment of the market that's a non-starter for um, a segment of your employee base that, that might be a non-starter for. And so being prepared to lose and stick to your guns um, helps you shape the culture that you know you need to have once you've made that decision, as opposed to trying to accommodate every single pre preference of your team. And these are trade-offs that business owners make all the time. Um, I think the question of how we want to do our work is just such a um, universal decision that basically every employer's had to make that it shocks us into realizing that these decisions do matter and that based on whatever you think helps your business win um, is going to have consequences in who will want to be along for that journey. In all cases, though, the articulation of it, the consistency of it, and the clear expectations is the path to winning. And that's true of any topic culturally, even beyond something like the return to office question. Yeah, um, you know, I'm very pro uh, hybrid work environment or remote first. I think that it's what I've seen on my team is that while I would love for everybody to be in person just because you get that collaboration and there's just so much that frankly, I just miss about the team being together. Um, I do think that it gives people more empowerment. And with that, I've seen, and I don't know if it's a direct result of this, but there seems to be some correlation that we see people get more creative and take more sense of ownership in their day-to-day -day stuff. You know, where we trust you to be productive and to do your job wherever it makes the most sense for you. So then there's like that reciprocal trust back. And um, I've just seen people really take that, like act like an owner concept beyond just the, the choice to work from home or to work from the office and really just get better at their jobs. And it feels like there's some correlation there. Totally. People usually refer to this as water cooler talk too, but I had yesterday a three minute meeting with someone who was in the office. Uh, it was a real time thing, super small, tight subject. And I just wandered over to their desk and we like jammed it out in three minutes. And afterward, I was like, man, this is a huge ROI on what otherwise would have been like, we have to schedule time and it's inevitably gonna be set aside for like a half an hour, but we only had three minutes of stuff to talk about. It was an important three minutes, an impactful three minutes, but I was like, man, this is a great reminder that at least to a degree, uh, being able to do that quick pass you in the hallway conversation that has impact to it um, can really be a difference maker instead of this, you know, 15 minute blocks all day, every day scheduling that we've all become accustomed to. I think I was a giant jerk and interrupted the middle of that meeting too. I think oh, I know you know. Why. Actually, that was my three minute meeting. So I, we had <laughs> I think a, it was. a three minute meeting and then a 20 second meeting inside of it with you. It was yeah. great. <laughs> All right, we got a couple more. Um, the next one is what's the secret sauce? The combination of benefit offerings and positive company culture practices that every company should have to keep talent happy. Every company's formula for their secret sauce, I think, is different. I think the key factor um, is articulation both externally to the market, these are the people you want to attract and bring to your business, and then for retention, which is how you communicate the value of what you offer as an employer to your current team. And so whether it's a topic like benefits, which is like, check out how awesome our health insurance is, or hey, hey team, this year we're switching our life and disability to so-and-so because of this specific reason that's very strategic and on brand for your business or if it's on a more esoteric topic, which is like what we do with GRIT, our core values, where we will celebrate specific people's contributions to tenacity, uh, which is the T in GRIT. Um, and we will actually recognize it and celebrate it and call it out part of the employee recognition component of culture. In all of those cases, they all come back to a common thread, which is how much work are you willing to put in as a business owner to not only developing your, for example, core values or your vision or designing your benefits package. That's just step one. That's like getting started. How much work are you willing to put into iterating those concepts, 
embedding them into the business and then articulating them back to your team at all times, the value of which has this huge long tail of ROI on it because it keeps everybody rowing in the same direction. It allows the talent that totally subscribes to your version of culture to want to stay with you because you're you know, truly on the same page. And it allows you to be more selective about the talent that makes sense uh, if you're a growing company and you're adding people to the business because everybody's going to come with their own version of the same subjects. A good example here we point out a lot at Beam is transparency. We might say as a company, we are very transparent, but for a new employee, how do they know if my definition of very transparent is the same as their definition of very transparent? And being, being able to foster a conversation and for us to be very articulate about specifically what we mean by transparency is an important factor that really does matter to people. And the bigger your company is, the more those small decisions and those small discussions um, can really add up to mattering, not just to your employee churn or your employee um, attraction, but also just the health of the organization and how aligned the whole team is. What are your thoughts? You've seen this play out at multiple levels of, of our business. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that the, to me, one of the most simple things that, um, you know, a company can do to figure out what are, what's that right mix to keep employees happy is ask, you know, um, a couple of years ago, Beam started doing an employee survey around what are, which employee benefits do you love? Which ones do you never use? What do we not have that you want to see added in? And then, um, you know, again, with transparency, sharing those details out and then, you know, sharing what the plan is going to be to get to the things that people have asked for. Um, and then also, you know, maybe digging into why certain things weren't being offered. Um, I think that just keeping it really simple sometimes is the best solution. Just ask people instead of assuming what they want. We, in our people in HR team at, at Beam, we, um, every time we're together, everybody, the most common word used in those meetings is pragmatism or pragmatic. And it's such an important filter on lots of the decisions that can get really tricky um, in, in the HR department, as we all know. Um, what is the most pragmatic solution to this problem? What's the most practical thing we can do to move forward? And it turns out that simple filter is incredibly powerful um, to cutting through a lot of the noise because there are always these arguments around exceptions or what do we do about this situation or what about this? What about this legal thing? It always comes up in those HR discussions. So we work backwards from pragmatism and that alone I think has been a powerful tool to help us or concept to help us be able to move quickly and then trust ourselves to evolve and iterate um, as the business evolves and necessitates a different approach. You wanna do one more, Haley? Let's do one more. All right, I'm gonna save this one for last. It feels like kind of a, a good juicy one. Um, what has been the biggest impact at Beam as a result of the company culture you've created? Whoa, that is a good one. Fantastic question. Um, so I would say that the largest, the largest single impact that we've noticed, and we hear this all the time actually from brokers, uh, clients, and members uh, as well that we interact with. Um, Beam is a growing company, very fast growing, and we are building new products and we're learning more and more about how to tell our story and um, adding features to our products and um, upgrading and um, uh, expanding our, our services functions around the business as well. And, you know, like any growing business, there's a certain amount of uh, chaos baked into that pie. You've experienced a lot of it uh, firsthand yourself over your tenure at Beam. And, and we don't always meet our own standard, for, frankly, for um, the service level that we want to keep or, you know, this key metric that we're tracking as a business. And so we fail a lot as a business. We fail our own expectations. We fail key partners. We fail um, our own like personal expectations. We fail our business goals. It happens all the time. And so what's critical in those moments is how we respond 
as a business, both like psychologically, can we pick ourselves up and try again and try even harder next time or try, you know, uh, take an honest assessment of what did we do wrong? How do we get better as a business? Um, and then the same thing has to be true of how we interact with the external market. And when people ask me like what I'm most proud of at Beam, I sometimes, you know, I've got a lot of stock answers to that question, but what I'm really actually most proud of in the business is both internally and externally, what I constantly hear uh, from, let's say a, a broker partner of ours, it might be something like, hey, you know, I, you know, I had some issues with you guys a couple months ago because of this thing that we were working on, it didn't quite work out. But you know what? Your people are fantastic. They are so friendly, they're nice, they're engaged, they're ready to help, they outwork everybody else that, um, that I interact with. They are humble and um, uh, transparent and authentic and just fantastic people that I wanna be around. And we hear a lot of that internally too, which is the tenacity with which we operate as we're trying to fix all these hard problems and grow, grow, grow as an organization. Um, also gives us these moments where we're like, how is it possible that we can just keep um, overcoming all the barriers that naturally exist in a company as ambitious as ours? And we're constantly impressed, my co-founders and I, our senior team and I, we're constantly impressed that um, the people have such a um, vibrancy and authenticity to the group. And so the intentions are always who cares what happened? We have short memories, but we take everything we learn and we move forward as a team and we work to get better and better and better always. And that just, it excites me at a very visceral level because you will always bet on a company that has that approach and you will always bet on people that have that approach uh, because it um, means that despite all of the chaos of the great resignation and COVID and remote work and all the sub, you know, more specific challenges in our industry or specific challenges in our business or on your team or whatever, uh, that we know we have a team that's highly resilient and has the grit to win in the long term. And uh, I love that it aligns with our culture. And I think we do a great job of selecting beamers to our team that reflect those values and then live by them. And then years and years later, I'm like, Haley, you've been here five years and look at how much you've grown. Look at all the things you've overcome along the way. It's absolutely amazing. I don't know that I could have answered that any better. I don't think there's anything that I could add. That was a phenomenal answer, Fro. And we are just a few minutes to time. And I think we've got one wrap up that uh, I think Sam's going to run for us. Yeah, thank you, Haley. Thank you, Fro. Um, and, and of course, thank you all for being here uh, asking great questions. Um, we got some great answers, so thank you both. Um, as you can see on the screen, we would love to hear from you, those of you who are on. I know people uh, like to jump right away, but if you have a few minutes, we'd love to just hear from you. Drop a note in the chat or the Q&A. Um, let us know what you would love to hear from Beam uh, for 2023. We are starting that planning, so we really want to know what you're interested in. Um, on top of that, we should uh, you should be getting a survey link come through from our lovely Sarah on the back end. Um, and again, we'd love the feedback so that we can continue and to continue to improve. Um, and as I said at the beginning of the webinar, we are going to be sending out the slides and a recording of everything today. Um, so yeah, if you have a, a chance, just a minute, open up that link, respond to our survey, pop anything in. Um, in our chat as you're going out the door as what you want to hear for 2023. And, and that's it. Thank you all so, so much. Have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you next time.